Preface. Is your money smiling? A few years ago, I had a unique experience that became the inspiration for the concept and title of this book. A woman whom I had just met at a party asked if she could take a look at my wallet. As shocking as this question might be to some, it isn't particularly uncommon in Japanese culture to ask to see the contents of someone's wallet. And since there were many other people in the room, I wasn't afraid she would run away with my identity or my money. So with little hesitation, I handed her my leather wallet. I was a little startled, however, when she immediately went for the cash and began taking out all the large bills. This one's okay. This one's good. This one's good too. She said quietly to herself as she assessed each bill. For a moment, I thought she was searching for something in particular. Perhaps there are special symbols or markings on the bills. But I soon realized she wasn't looking for anything of the sort. Then she shocked me again and began sorting the bills in a way I had never seen before. Good job. All of your money looks good, she said as she put the newly organized money back into the wallet and handed it back to me. That's great news, I said, confused yet somewhat relieved to have passed her test. But if you don't mind me asking, what were you looking for? Oh, I was checking to see whether or not your money was smiling. She went on to explain that money can laugh or cry, depending on how it was given or received. If it is given out of guilt, anger, or sadness, the money will be crying. In contrast, if the money is given out of love, gratitude, or happiness, the money will be smiling, even laughing, because it will be imbued with a positive energy from the giver. Money has the ability to smile or cry? Money changes when it is given with a certain energy or feeling? What? Even though I was already financially well off at the time and thought I knew much about money, I was taken aback by these insights. You see, I had always been very fortunate with money. At the age of 20, I made a choice to be happy and wealthy by the age of 30. So I started my own consulting and accounting business, and during my 20s, I helped many people with their financial and business needs. In the process, I did all right. In fact, well enough that at the age of 29, when my wife and I had just welcomed a newborn baby girl into our lives, I had the freedom to decide to stay home and raise her. Those were some of the happiest days of my life, and it was the best decision I ever made. Not just because I was able to spend as much time with my daughter as possible, but also because it was with her that I discovered my second career, helping millions of others lead happy, prosperous, and peaceful lives. It all happened when I was at a park with my daughter on a gorgeous day. We were happily playing when I saw a mother and her young daughter, who was about the same age as my own daughter, fighting. The mother was distressed and in a hurry. She yelled, your mom has to go to work, so let's go home. But the little one kept saying to her mother, we just got here, I wanna play more, please. After a few minutes of battle, the reluctant little girl was dragged by her mother back home. I felt so terrible for the girl and her mother. I knew that if that mother had a choice, she would have wanted to stay in the park too. After all, it was a beautiful and sunny day. What parent wouldn't want to be outside playing with their child? At that moment, I decided I needed to do something. I wanted to help not just this mother, but all parents and people struggling to make ends meet. I wanted to take away her pain, stress, and frustration. So that very afternoon, after my own daughter was tired of playing, I decided I would write a short essay that would impart the wisdom I had gained over the years about making money and becoming prosperous. When I first began, I thought I could write only five pages. But when I finished for the day, I was amazed to see that I had written 26 pages in one sitting. I got so excited that I printed the essay out, stapled the pages together, and immediately started giving them away to friends. To my surprise, they loved it. Soon, strangers began to call me and say they had heard about it and wanted copies of their own. So every day for several days, I printed copies, stapled them together, and sent them to whoever wanted one. However, I quickly tired of stapling booklets together each day. After complaining to a friend about the process, he suggested a local printer. The salesperson on the phone talked me into ordering a 3,000 print run to cut down on costs. and. Without thinking, I said okay. 
Before I knew it, two trucks came to my home to drop off what looked like a warehouse full of boxes. You can imagine my wife's face when she saw the pallets of books, which filled an entire room in our house. Being the nice person she is, she forgave me, and sort of. She would let it slide this one time with one caveat. I had a month to get rid of all the boxes. So what did I do? I started handing the booklets out to everyone I knew, and people I didn't. But when they were all gone, I continued to get requests and orders. At first I didn't know if people were requesting them because the content was good or because it was free. Nevertheless, I knew I was onto something. And when I reached 100,000 copies given away, I definitely knew. At that point, a publisher actually called me and asked me if I would be interested in writing an entire book. My first response? No way, I'm not a writer. But the publisher was insistent. You have all the time in the world. Why don't you give it a try? I couldn't argue with his point. My daughter was on her way to kindergarten soon, and then what would I do with all my time? I guess I could write. And that's exactly what I did. Since that fateful day on the playground, I've published more than 50 books and sold almost 8 million copies in Japan. Not bad for a retired dad who had an idea on a playground with his daughter. What began as a stroke of insight and an urge to help out a struggling working mother turned into not only a career, but my purpose in life. That purpose, I realized, was to help others find theirs and to become prosperous and free in the meantime. Needless to say, after writing 50 books, I thought I had this money thing pretty much figured out. But when my new friend, the mysterious wallet woman, handed me back my wallet, I got to thinking again just as I had done all those years ago back on the playground. This time, I started to think about money as energy. Money as energy. Holding the wallet my new friend had just returned to me, I thought, what a relief. All the money I have earned over the years and received came from happy people, grateful and joyful people. I then thought briefly about how I had earned my money. Yes, I had indeed received all my money through service. I had helped others become successful, wealthy, and empowered. I had helped others gain a sense of peace, joy, and gratitude. I thought how the people who paid me felt when they read my books or attended my seminars and workshops. Throughout the world, I have given seminars to thousands of people at a time. Then I thought about my books and how many people have changed their own lives because of them. They changed jobs, got married, had babies, and left unhappy or toxic relationships. I've heard from many who have started their own businesses. Some even have grown their businesses from nothing to publicly traded companies. I've also heard from others who didn't become fabulously wealthy but who felt rich and were very happy no matter what their bank statements reported. No longer affected by money-related stress, they were free to take out a new lease on life. Although I am often called a money guru, or money healer, my real job over the past decade, I realized while standing there and looking at my wallet, had been to help others find the tools they already possessed within themselves to heal their own lives and relationships with money. Then it occurred to me that yes, all the people who had given me their money had infused it with these feelings of gratitude and joy. So much happy energy. All this smiling money in my wallet was there because of others. Of course. Of course money is energy. Then I began thinking about my own feelings and the energy I pass along to others when I use money. I stood there for a few seconds and I realized, there are so many emotions wrapped up in our money. So many of us walk around with all this energy and it impacts not only ourselves but others as well. We like to think that money is just a number or a piece of paper, but it is so much more than that. Money brings with it so many emotions, more than we even realize. Even when we are aware of it, such as when we feel stressed about our endless stack of bills, our meager paychecks, or our lack of savings for the future, we often think we are powerless. We feel hopeless and defeated. We even feel resentment and jealousy of others who have more than us. We may have even given up trying to earn more or receive more. Instead, we say things like, that's just the way it is, and there isn't much we can do about it. So many of us think of money as the enemy, this dark force that is keeping us from living the life we're supposed to have or doing the things we love. 
So few of us see the potential that money has to bring us joy, gratitude, and happiness, especially when we give it away freely and with the same positive energy as we received it. After my new friend, the mysterious wallet woman, gave me back my money, I looked down and noticed the cash tucked safely away in the pocket. And it got me thinking, so much money exists in the world. There is so much money out there right now spreading happiness and love. But so much is also spreading sadness and fear. I wondered what, if anything, I could do to help infuse the world with as much love, gratitude, joy, prosperity, and peace as possible. I wondered how I could spread around as much happy money as possible. And so an idea came to me, much as it had all those years ago in the park with my daughter. I would write a book. I would share these insights with others, as many people as I possibly could. And this book, Happy Money, is the essence of what I have taught and learned from so many others. I'll try to help you answer the questions that so many people have asked me to answer over the years. How can I deal with money? Can I have more money without incurring great sacrifice? Can I have peace while I am alive? What can I do to create a happy, fulfilling, prosperous, and purpose-filled life? All those questions will be answered in this book. As my other books have changed millions of people's lives, this book will change yours too. My greatest hope is that this book will help you look at your life in a totally different way and transform your relationship with money. The comment I most often get from my readers is, Wow, this is new. I've never thought of money this way. I hope you have the same feeling. I hope it will be the start of your happy money life. I guarantee it will be an exciting one. Introduction Happy Money and Unhappy Money There are two kinds of money, happy money and unhappy money. Happy money is the kind that a 10-year-old boy uses to buy flowers for his mom on Mother's Day. Happy money is when parents gladly pinch pennies in order to save a few extra dollars each week to be able to send their kids to soccer camp or take piano lessons. There are so many ways regular old money can become happy money. Helping a struggling family member out of a bind. Sending a few dollars to those affected by a hurricane. Raising money by selling cookies for a homeless shelter. Investing in a business or a community project. Receiving money for work or services from satisfied clients. All the money circulated with love, care, and friendship is happy money. Happy money makes people smile and feel loved and cared for deeply. It is in many ways an active form of love a way in which people can see, feel, and touch. Often money can help others in a way nothing else can. For example, when someone is going through a major hardship like losing their entire home to a fire, thoughts and prayers and good vibes will get them only so far. However, I guarantee you that money will help a family get back on their feet, buy them food, and give them a temporary roof over their heads in a way that good vibes just can't. Conversely. Unhappy money is the kind of money you use to begrudgingly pay your rent, bills, and taxes. We don't have to stretch our imaginations too far. We've all experienced the many forms of unhappy money. Paying or receiving money as alimony after an ugly divorce. Receiving a salary from an employer for a job you don't like but can't bring yourself to leave. Unwillingly paying off credit cards with huge interest rates. Receiving money from someone who resents paying you, like an unhappy customer who says, you don't deserve it, but I'll pay you anyway to honor the contract. Stealing money from anyone. Money circulated in frustration, anger, sadness, and despair is unhappy money. This kind of money makes people stressed, desperate, aggravated, depressed, and sometimes violent. It deprives people of their dignity, self-esteem, and gentleness of heart. Whenever you receive and spend money and you do so with negative energy, it becomes unhappy money. Choosing your flow. If there are two kinds of money, then there are only two ways to deal with money. We are in a flow of either happy money or unhappy money. Depending on which flow you choose, 
your life and the outcomes in your life will vary. Let me state this plainly. It is not how much you make or have that makes you have happy money or unhappy money. It is the energy with which your money is given and received that determines your flow. Whether you make a lot of money or very little, your money can be in either flow. Ultimately, it is your choice. If you want to be in the flow of happy money, you can. You can choose to be grateful when you receive money, and you can give generously and with joy and enthusiasm. However, based on my experience working with thousands of individuals in seminars and workshops who have come to me seeking advice about money, I realize this is easier said than done. Most people aren't mindful of their relationship to the flow of money. In fact, I would venture to say that most people, whether they realize it or not, are already in a deeply committed, unhappy relationship with their money. And where there is unhappy money, there are unhappy people. The two go hand in hand, if you will. For example, if your family and the people immediately around you, at school, in the workplace, or in social groups, are in flow with an unhappy money group, chances are you've been on the receiving end of some seriously resentful, ungrateful, and joyless money. Since most of us don't have a healthy relationship with money, we spend a lot of our precious time worrying about and resenting money. Some of us resent it and find it so difficult to comprehend that we don't even want to think about it ever. Even if we know on some level that we'll have to deal with it at some point, we avoid it at all costs. In fact, some of us are so tired from worrying about a lack of money that we have little energy for anything else in life. We become weighed down by the burden of working, making ends meet, and keeping up with our neighbors. It becomes so overwhelming, in fact, that we let the bills stack up. We don't pay bills. We don't count the money in our wallet and we avoid looking at our bank statements. And then our problems, like interest, compound. So few of us realize just how much energy is required to think about money or how much money determines even our most basic decisions. I want you to stop and think about it for a moment. Do your friends and family vary widely in their financial resources and backgrounds? Do you run with a country club crowd or are most of your friends working nine to five gigs? Do your friends have similar homes or cars? So many of us think it's an accident or luck that we meet or socialize with the people we do. But chances are, our socioeconomic status determines much in our lives, whether we like it or not. So yes, our life is controlled by money to some extent. Who we are, where we went to school, where we grew up, who we become friends with, who we make connections with in the working world, and how we choose to make and spend our money determines so much in our lives. And let me assure you, it is not only the poor and the middle class who are affected by the flow of money and who can receive and give money infused with negative energy. The upper middle class and wealthy folks are also influenced by the negative flow of money. I know plenty of wealthy clients who, though richer than Midas, are deathly afraid of losing what they have. They have no idea how to even enjoy their money. They are constantly stressed out trying relentlessly to keep up with the Joneses. Of course, if being rich is your goal, you can aim for that. But most people realize that making a lot of money isn't going to solve all their problems. In fact, many people realize they don't even need to have a lot of money to create their ideal lives. Rather, it's those who figure out how to change their attitude toward and their relationship with money by healing their past wounds associated with money who seem to feel the wealthiest regardless of what they have. So what is money? During the last half of my career, I focused on healing the money wounds that people have. When most people realize that these wounds are how they occurred and how they have affected their daily lives, they start to create healthy priorities in life. If you heal the pain you have about money, your financial situations will absolutely change and dramatically so. Your money, and hence your life, is a reflection of your beliefs about money. If you believe it is something that can be used for good, that is abundant, and that can be given and received freely, your outer life will begin to reflect that inner change. But if you hold on to negative mindsets and false beliefs about money, that it is evil, that it creates drama, that it is the root cause of all that is bad in your life, 
You can bet that your outer reality will soon reflect that inner monologue. Early Experiences with Unhappy Money Although I never intended to become a writer who helped people with money, my quest for happy money started when I was very small. When I was at an early age, money had a huge impact on my life. In many ways, the lessons I learned as a child have stuck with me to this day. My father was an accountant with a successful private business. When his clients were visiting, it was my job to wait on them and serve them tea. I amused myself by finding opportunities to ask all these experienced businessmen questions they'd never expect an eight-year-old boy to know anything about. Many didn't know how to react when I started inquiring about that month's sales profits, return on equity, turnout ratio, or shareholder incentives. It was a fun hobby. At a certain point, I started to notice that although some of my father's clients started off wearing somewhat shabby clothes, over time, they began walking in with nice suits and expensive shoes. Many upgraded their cars while they were at it. At the same time, I observed that others seemed to be moving in the opposite direction. Even among the clients who appeared to be wealthy, eventually it became apparent to my eight-year-old self that most people could be divided into two general types. The irritated, rushed, and busy, and the peaceful, content, and happy. One afternoon, something occurred that shook me to the core and has remained with me ever since. I came home from elementary school to find my otherwise stoic father crying. This was the man who had taught me karate and kendo. He taught me to stand up to bullies and protect people who were getting hurt. I couldn't imagine anything that would make him cry, but there he was, in stark contrast to his usual self, seemingly falling apart before my eyes. My mother took me aside and told me that my father felt responsible for a tragedy that had occurred. One of my father's clients had murdered his entire family and then killed himself. Because my father had denied the man a loan when he had come desperately begging for money a few days earlier, he felt he was to blame. Later I found out that although my father initially had said no, he had fully intended to lend his client the money, at a later date. He wanted to help his client's family recover from their severe financial situation, but wanted to prevent that money from falling directly into the pockets of loan sharks who would profit from their suffering. With a heavy heart, my father arranged the funeral. The consequences of his actions were never far from his mind, and he fell into a period of dark depression and began abusing alcohol. He never fully recovered. His smile disappeared, and so did our families. It was devastating. Until then, I had never regarded money with anything other than positive feelings. Children do not inherently associate money with fear. For the first time, I realized that money could bring you much more than just success and happiness. One mistake, and you could lose your entire family. This memory formed a distinct impression on me about the dark consequences of money. That was the day I made up my mind to be financially secure when I grew up and got married so my own family would never suffer a similar fate. I might have been too young to be totally conscious of it, but this event impacted my entire view of money. Even if my family was financially comfortable, what good was it if people around us were having financial difficulties? After all, we are always affected and influenced by those who are closest to us. I decided to pursue the quest for the meaning of money. What was its purpose? A few years later, I observed a phenomena of sorts. Japan was going through what was later called a bubble economy. Again, I witnessed firsthand the relationship people had with money. What happened when they had a lot of it, and then, quite suddenly, none of it. After getting into college, I looked for great teachers who could teach me about business and money. Again, I recognized a dichotomy. There were two kinds of wealthy people, the happy ones and unhappy ones. The happy ones seemed to have great relationships with their families, and all of them worked in fields that they loved. They also received great respect from employees and clients alike, and would give the shirts off their backs to people in need. Conversely, I observed unhappy wealthy people were thinking about how much more they could make and how to increase their net worth. All they could think about was creating new business and taking advantage of other people legally. They were your classic two faced con artists. They tended to treat their employees poorly and were rude to waiters and drivers 
but behaved well with those who could give them money or do something to help them get ahead. What made the two so different? I knew that there had to be a reason behind their behavior. There also had to be some kind of formula, something that added up. Why did some people who had money become happy and generous while others did not? Little did I know that I was beginning a lifelong pursuit of happy money. Chapter 1. What does money mean to you? Solving the mystery of money. Before I begin to explain what money is, the better question to start this chapter with is, what does money mean to you? I am sure that depending on who is asking, your answers will vary slightly. For example, if a nine-year-old girl asks you, what is money? You might answer with, there are two kinds of money, paper bills and coins. You can buy stuff with money. But what if you were explaining money to an adult? Would you say, money is a medium of exchange for goods and services? While both answers are correct, you and I know there is more to money than a medium of exchange or something you simply use to buy stuff with. We make and spend money every day, yet we cannot answer this one simple question. I've asked people for years the following question, what does money mean to you? I'm always surprised by the answers I receive. After asking thousands of people from countries all over the world, I never hear the same answer. It means something different to each person. I recall one person telling me money is a heavenly god, while another said, it is the devil. I've heard money explained to me by some as an expression of love, and by others as a slave driver. The extreme diversity in answers to this question demonstrates that the meaning of money depends on the person. On the surface, physical money is just a simple piece of paper or metal. However, even if all the people around you have the same faces printed on those pieces of paper and the same designs stamped on each coin, it's incredible how much variety there is in the meaning it holds for each of us. When looking at the coin, some people will feel anger rising up, while others will feel joy. But what's really interesting is that we don't have the same emotional reaction whatsoever, even when looking at toy money made for children, except for perhaps Monopoly money. Why? Because the types of emotional reactions we have when playing the game, for the most part, are fairly consistent with how we react to real money. Since we often play the game Monopoly to win, we approach that money with the same energy and attachment we do when we spend money in real life. Who among us doesn't want to win, or what we collectively think of as winning in real life? Earning more money, owning desirable properties, not having to pay a lot in income taxes, and avoiding going to jail. Who among us doesn't rejoice at the surprise surplus of cash or a payout of dividends when the chance card says we have won it, in the game of Monopoly or in real life? In other words, whatever our feelings toward property and money are in real life, we will attach those same feelings to Monopoly money. How do you feel about owning property? Paying taxes, paying rent? Are you conservative in your purchases or do you go all out and take risks? Play the game yourself and observe yourself and others and see what emotions bubble up with each throw of the dice. If you want to see just how much emotional energy we attach to those pieces of paper and metal coins in real life, See the energy you attach to them when you're playing a game. I promise it will be revelatory. In my experience, the people who have the most fun feel the most confident and realize it's just a game always come out ahead. They may not have the most money in the bank, but they remain unattached to the outcome of winning or having the most and enjoy the process, the give and take. They focus on feeling like a winner rather than on actually winning. So how do you want to play the money game? What if I told you money is a game? How well do you play now? Would you consider yourself to be winning? Once again, winning is not how well you do financially. It is how good you feel about playing. Unlike Monopoly, in which you move around the board in a consistent manner and pretty much know what to expect, Playing with your money in real life isn't so predictable. You're not moving five spaces or 12 spaces in a clockwise direction. Most of us, in fact, feel pretty lost when we're playing the real-life money game. We don't know which property is going to yield the most returns. 
We don't know if the house we own is going to become infested with mold or a tree is going to fall on it. We don't know if a family member is going to get cancer, incur huge medical bills, and lose the ability to contribute to the family income for several years while they fight the illness. We don't know if the company we work for is going to make some bad financial decisions and will have to lay us off someday. We don't know if the industry we spent our life working for will become obsolete when another, disruptive industry comes in and takes over. The truth is, the game of money we're playing in real life is pretty fraught. Economic changes, family issues, and natural disasters sure have a way of making us feel lost. In fact, most of us feel like we've lost the game before we even get to roll the proverbial dice. And we're told that things could change if we just work a little harder, a little smarter. So we do. Sound familiar? Chances are, if you're reading this book, you've been told these rules of engagement already. Work hard and the money will follow. Let me tell you something that you already probably know on an instinctive level. People who have more money or seem wealthier than you aren't any smarter than you or working any harder than you. A lot of people in this world have worked themselves to death and never had two nickels to rub together. Let me assure you, working harder isn't the only answer. I know a lot of smart, hardworking people who don't feel they are compensated enough and aren't winning the money game. And I also know a lot of people who feel they have enough money and have nothing to worry about. Interestingly, many of these folks don't have more money than my seemingly wealthy friends. A tricky game because rules keep changing. The money game is an interesting one. My mentor, Wahei Takeda, once said, There is no end in the money game. It's like baseball. Even if you are winning in the bottom of the ninth inning, that doesn't guarantee a win. An exceptional hitter can bring everyone on base home with just one crack of the bat. The money game is the same. Even if you are wealthy in your 30s or 40s, that doesn't mean something disastrous won't happen and leave you destitute and unable to retire in your 60s. We've all heard of people who seem to earn enough money to last for several lifetimes, but who had to file for bankruptcy. Examples abound of famous wealthy celebrities and athletes who lost everything they made and died with massive amounts of debt. Sometimes people lose their money because they've spent way beyond their means, but other times it's because the rules of money kept changing, or what constitutes money changes. Look at the real estate bubble of 2008. For years before that, people were told, invest in real estate, that's where the money is. Housing prices soared and loans were easy to qualify for. But the rules changed. The housing market plummeted seemingly overnight. The houses that people owned, houses they were sure they could sell for double the price they paid as they had in the past, were worth almost nothing. People moved on to gold. Gold is golden, financial experts say when there is turmoil in every other market. But when the economy is good, gold becomes just a yellow metal that doesn't generate any interest. We are approaching an interesting time when all sectors of the global economy are connected more than ever, but the system as we know it is falling apart. New systems are appearing every day, and even how we think of and experience money is changing. For example, these days everyone in financial circles is talking about cryptocurrency. It's the future and the most reliable system. And yet there is a lot of chatter about hacking. What seems to be the most reliable system cannot be trusted either. There are so many experts and financial gurus out there claiming to know where the next best place to invest your money is or how to make more money. And many of the gurus are saying the opposite thing. So what or who can you trust? When it comes to money, what, if anything, is in your control? I would venture to say how we feel about money is what we can control. And that has more to do with our feelings about being wealthy than any real estate, stock, gold, or cryptocurrency market out there. What is money, really? True, there was a time when the form of money used to be simpler. Just 150 years ago, when people wanted to buy something at a market, they paid in cash. At that time, they had only bills and coins. Now we have checks, bank accounts, credit cards, Venmo, PayPal, and cryptocurrency. The money we use at a grocery store and the money that travels electronically on Wall Street 
seems very different today from what it was in centuries past. There was a time not too long ago when people stuck their money under mattresses or in safes in their own homes. They had to see and touch the money regularly to know that it was there and in their possession. However, money is just a symbol when you think about it. We rarely see it or touch it in its printed form today. We only need to click on our phones and see our bank statements to know that our money exists. Most of us receive money through our bank accounts and then we spend it with a credit card. It's not uncommon to go days, weeks, or months without ever needing to touch cash. In most parts of Asia, Japan in particular, people rarely carry wallets anymore because every transaction is easily taken care of with their smartphones. Simultaneously, billions of dollars, euros, marks, and yen are being traded all over the world. We cannot perceive that the money we use every day and the money traveling around in the electronic world are the same. Today, a hedge fund manager can make the equivalent of somebody's annual income in just a few minutes. These things confound us. How is this even possible? So where is your money? The concept of money is actually quite vague when you think about it. The money you think you have in the bank is not really there. Once you deposit your money, the banks lend it to someone else. So physically, your money is no longer there. All that remains are those numbers you saw when you checked your bank account on your smartphone. Let's try this as a thought experiment. You may think you have money, but what if it's an illusion? As scary as this idea is, suppose you check your statement one day and there is no money there. You haven't spent it. It's just gone. You call the bank and say, where's my money? And the bank says, you don't have any money in the account. How would you be able to prove otherwise? Do you have records of deposits made? Sure. Do you have transaction histories? Sure. But what if the bank says it doesn't have any of that? How do you prove the hours you work, the interest you accrued, the amount of money you deposited? Imagine how you would feel if it all disappeared. Now let's think of the money you owe college loans, credit card debt, mortgages. Maybe you feel burdened by these loans. Now, just as you imagine the money you have in your checking or savings account was an illusion of sorts, imagine that your loans and debts were illusions too. What if they all just disappeared? We don't quite have the same angst about these types of illusions disappearing that we do when our money disappears. Go figure. Most of us, however, trust the system we operate in. We trust that the banks will give us our money back when we ask for it, and we trust that we owe the amounts of our loans and that we have to pay them. We feel safe that our money is in the bank, and we feel stressed that we have loans to pay off. Now that we seem to know where our money is, we have to ask ourselves, what is it for, really? And where does it all seem to go? Where does all your money go? All our lives we study, work hard, and pay taxes. But after paying all the bills, most of us have very little at the end of each month. We have college loans, car loans, credit card debt, and mortgages, all of which feels like an enormous burden with no relief in sight. And then, as if to add insult to injury, compared to our income, there is never enough for us to spend on what we are supposed to have. We are bombarded with advertising at every turn for these supposedly must-have items. We need the newest model of the luxury car we just bought. The old SUV won't do anymore. We need upgrades to our phones. We have friends who have traveled to exotic locations or taken their families to Disney World. Not once, but every year. And we feel like we're missing out if we don't make the trip ourselves. There's even a term now for this. FOMO. Fear of missing out. Everyone has a case of FOMO these days. Whether it's cosmetic cream or a dress or suit that will make us more handsome, more beautiful, or richer looking, we just have to buy it or we're missing out. The list is endless. New home improvements, new gadgets, new shoes, new experiences. It's all new, 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 all the time. We are constantly told by advertisers, television shows, and even our friends that what we have isn't good enough anymore. True, we are not going to die if we don't have any of these things. But our kids just might. What parent hasn't heard? I'll just die if I don't have what my friend, insert name, has. Or, everyone but me has, 
insert whatever is the latest fashion or gadget trend. And I'll look like a loser if I don't have it. Please, mom and dad, can I have it? And kids aren't the only ones who do this. We all know someone who is always bragging about their latest purchase. And then we go back to our own homes and think to ourselves, well, this television, which I loved up until an hour ago, is cheap and outdated. I need a new one too. And when we can't afford those things that our friends have, we get confused and upset. We see people of privilege enjoying life without doing anything. Or so we tell ourselves, and we get angry. I work just as hard, if not harder. I deserve good things too, we complain. We tell ourselves we are doing everything right, but we still don't have enough. It's never enough. Someone always has something better. Someone is always doing more. Something is not right. It's just not fair, we say. When my daughter was young, I moved my family to Boston for a year for my daughter's education. At the time, she didn't speak much English and came home one day and asked me about a phrase she kept hearing throughout the day. She said, Daddy, everyone said this one sentence, and I want to know what it means. I asked her what it was. She then told me the sentence kids were using all day was, It's not fair. I couldn't help but smile. Yes. When it comes to money and life, all over the world, we feel and hear it's not fair on a regular basis. Children hear their parents say it at home. It's not fair that so-and-so makes more money than me. It's not fair how hard I work and how little I get paid for my efforts. And then our kids go to school and see a child playing with a doll they desire and they say, it's not fair that she has that doll right now and I don't, or... It's not fair that he gets to be on the swing for all of recess, and I don't. And a teacher may have to be called in and explain to the children, there is enough time for everyone to ride on the swings, just wait your turn. Or, there are plenty of other toys to play with, let's go find you one. The teacher is correct. There is enough time, and there are enough swings, dolls, toys, etc., but children cannot see that. They see only what they don't have what they aren't doing, just as their parents are seeing only what they don't have and what they aren't doing. This is what we call the myth of scarcity. The myth of scarcity. People everywhere in the world feel they are not treated fairly. Many of us believe that it's a zero-sum game. If someone else has something, then we can't have it. We believe that if others have a lot of money, they are automatically depriving us of our money. We attach a lot of negative emotions to money when we think of it this way. The scarcity mindset is a belief that there are limited resources in the world, and if we don't get what we want when we want it, someone else will. We have to get it soon because it's running out. And if it's running out, we have to do everything in our power to make sure we have it before anyone else does. All sorts of negative influences drive our behavior when we think like this. We operate out of fear, jealousy, and greed. We take what we can get whenever we can get it, and we don't think about how it affects others or the greater good. But this way of thinking never serves us for very long, because when we do get what we want, it's still never enough, because there is always going to be something bigger, better, and more desirable out there. And if we don't have that either, we'll be missing out. It's an endless cycle that keeps us trapped in a never-ending process of accumulation and spending and then wanting more. One of the greatest books about the scarcity mindset and its devastating consequences is The Soul of Money, Transforming Your Relationship with Money and Life by my friend Lynn Twist, a global activist and founder of the Pachamama Alliance. Lynn is recognized throughout the world for her insights and her achievements in helping to alleviate global hunger, ensure women's rights, and inspire people to live lives of integrity, generosity of spirit, and abundance. She writes, This internal condition of scarcity, this mindset of scarcity, lives at the very heart of our jealousies, our greed, our prejudice, and our arguments with life. Every argument, every prejudice, every petty disagreement comes down to the idea that someone is getting something I am not, which is at the heart of scarcity. Therefore, to overcome jealousy, fear, greed, and prejudice, we must eliminate the idea of scarcity, the idea that things just aren't fair. 
The reason my daughter was hearing it's not fair all day was that in every instance, the children were looking at what they didn't have and not what they did. I imagine the child who wanted the doll finally did get the doll. And I have no doubt that while that child was playing with the doll, another child had not only a doll, but also a carriage for the doll. Well, that's just not fair. And the same goes for us adults. We have a house, we have a car, we have clothes. But our neighbors have more expensive clothes with fashionable labels on them, bigger homes and more expensive and flashier cars. They are wealthy, they have more, and if they have more, then I have no chance at getting it. They've taken my piece of the pie. But have they? Let's look at this a little more in depth. Losing our peace of mind because of money. How many dreams and marriages have been torn apart because of money? How much peace of mind have we lost? More than we should. When I ask a room full of people about stressful childhood experiences related to money, I inevitably hear something along the lines of, I wanted to take ballet classes, but my mom told me we couldn't afford it. Substitute ballet with baseball, gymnastics, ice skating, or any number of hobbies we dreamed of pursuing as children, and it's safe to say we have all heard that story in one form or another. As counterintuitive as this sounds, those among us whose parents told us directly that we were too poor when we were young should consider ourselves lucky. Sure, we may now feel resentment toward money, but at least we don't continue to blame ourselves for our parents' money troubles. Some unfortunate children suffer needlessly and feel like it's their fault their parents are poor. Their parents constantly complain about how much it costs to provide for them. Some even go so far as to say, I would be rich if it weren't for you kids. And then there are parents who operate in a more passive-aggressive, damaging way. Out of embarrassment or anger over their financial circumstances, these parents tell their kids that the reason they can't take those hockey lessons is because they never follow through on anything. Or worse, they aren't talented enough and it would be a waste of money. And what does a child think when he or she hears that? I'm a waste of money. This painful distortion of the truth is more likely the unintentional result of the parent's psychological issues than an attempt at manipulation. But the end result is the same. The children of these parents come to associate money with pain and suffering, and they internalize it so much that they believe they are the root cause of the suffering. Talk about emotional baggage. Rooting through our emotional garbage related to money. Does money help you with whatever you want to do? Or is it an obstacle that always gets in your way? Because of money, have you been unable to start your dream project or leave your unsatisfying job? Do you like money? Does money like you too? What stories do you tell yourself about money? Do you find yourself saying the same things your parents did about money? There's never enough, I wish I had more, I work so hard and still don't earn enough. Money, as we said earlier, comes in various forms, but it is simply an object in its simplest state. Yet we project so many feelings onto money. I actually feel a little sorry for money because it is an easy target of resentment and jealousy and always gets blamed for all the wrongdoings of humankind. But it's not the money that's the problem. We're the problem. For some people, money means security. For others, money is a monster that can rip them apart at any moment. For still others, it's a symbol of freedom, or it represents the control exerted over them by their boss or parents or family. By checking whatever feeling you project onto money, you can recognize your own emotional baggage. If you can do that, you can see money clearly. Why is this so difficult? Because getting to that place takes a lot of understanding and introspection. It means digging deep and figuring out what your own beliefs about money are, understanding how you develop these beliefs, and ultimately discovering what money means to you. Three functions of money. Confusion about what money is and what it means to us is often closely linked to a feeling. We may feel used, discarded, or taken advantage of. We feel like life is unfair. We feel unworthy and diminished. We feel that others have more than we do. A lot of these feelings result from the functions of money. Money primarily serves three functions. 
The Function of Exchange Most people can relate to this. We use money in exchange for something. It can be food, a train ticket, or an hour of massage therapy. This exchange function gives money power, because once we obtain money, we feel like we can exchange it for anything. It is almost an automatic process or an innate desire. Since we inherently need things to survive, food, clothing, shelter, we need a means to obtain those things, money. When we don't have enough money to do so, we panic. We feel like our lives or our family's lives are in peril, and everything related to money, earning and spending money, becomes stressful. The function of saving. Another reason people want to hold on to their money is that they want to preserve its value and, by extension, their own value. For example, in the Stone Age, humans hunted giant mammoths. If they didn't eat an entire mammoth immediately or figure out a way to store it or make use of its parts, it would decay, and the work and effort of months of tracking the beast would be wasted. In order to preserve the value of their work and effort, they had to save, use, or trade the meat. The same goes for us. We don't want our labor to be in vain. We want it to retain its value. We want to see money in the bank after a hard work week. We want to see savings accrue after years of dedicated service. In other words, we want to have something show for our life's work. We want it to mean something. When we work week after week, year after year, and have nothing to show for it, we become dejected and depressed and feel like our lives lack meaning. We equate one's life's worth with his net worth. The function of growth. This is the core of capitalism. If you deposit money, it generates interest. So if you have money invested, it grows like a living thing. People who have more money get more money. This is why the wealthy get wealthier. Most of us are confused by this concept because it means that hard work and effort have little to do with one's success. We can also feel excluded. If we don't have any money left over to invest at the end of each month after paying our bills, how on earth will we ever generate enough money to accrue wealth? It's easy to see why the functions of money can make us feel inadequate or like the deck is stacked against us before we even begin to play the card game. But even if that feels true, it doesn't stop us from trying to make more money or wanting it. So if money is such trouble, why do we also seem to want more money in the first place? Six Reasons People Want Money Everyone wants more money. When you randomly ask a person what they want most, they will often reply, money. They can decide exactly how to use it later. Why do we want money so much? What are the underlying motivations that keep us constantly feeling in need of money? Once you can put into perspective the emotional reasons for wanting money, you will start to feel more connected to your own needs and less stressed about money. This is how you can be released from money's control over you. Over the years, I've observed many reasons why people think they want money. I've recognized some distinct patterns which I am going to describe as the six reasons why people want money. There is always an emotional drive behind wanting money. But if we become disconnected from the underlying emotions, we can get stuck in a cycle of trying to make money without understanding what we really need. Reason number one, to maintain a basic standard of living. We all need shelter, clothes, and food to eat, and a way to cook it. In the past, people attributed their livelihood to good farmland and forest, but today it is money that delivers to us the things we need. When most people are asked why they are working, they will reply, to put food on the table. It is important to understand the difference between what we consider to be the bare minimum and what we consider luxury. I've met many people who were making good salaries yet constantly felt like they had just enough to put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. When I looked at how they were spending their money, they had a house at the highest limit of their price range and a new car with an expensive lease and spent a huge percentage of their monthly income on food and entertainment. They also often had a home full of things they didn't actually use. The problem is that people connect money directly to survival so whenever they feel like they have a need, their instinct is to turn to money and buy something. 
Reason number two, to gain power. Money is often seen as something that has power to control people and make them do things. So it is not surprising that we regard rich people as powerful. But being powerful does not mean that you are in control, nor does it mean happiness. When we confuse money and power in this way, we never satisfy our need to feel in control of our own lives and are left always wanting more power, and thus, more money. And just like there is always someone with more money, there is always someone with more power. This corruptive and addictive force brings all kinds of negative emotions that block true happiness from our lives. Sometimes I meet very ambitious young people, and they say things to me about how they want to build a business empire and become one of the wealthiest people in the world. But what they don't understand is that even though wealth brings some power, money is not a replacement for things like integrity and trust and genuine love. You will never be able to win the hearts of people with money alone. I have come across many people who are powerful in business and society, but who feel powerless in their close relationships and in their own state of mind. Reason number three, to get back at others. All kinds of people, rich or poor, feel abused by others at times. If they are poor, they feel robbed of certain privileges. If they are rich, they feel disrespected or excluded by their peers. People who feel slighted by society can then be tempted to see money as a way to get revenge on those who held them back or made them suffer. But the bullies are just in their minds. The person who is really judging them is themselves, and yet they will buy things to compete with others, not realizing that no one is really competing against them. Even people who can't afford very expensive things can get wrapped up in using material items to puff themselves up as superior to others, just on a smaller scale. Some self-made millionaires try to show off their wealth as a way to compensate for other insecurities, but no matter how much they make or spend, their self-esteem never improves. They constantly feel that others are looking down on them or talking about them behind their backs. Reason number four, to find freedom. Some people think that money can buy freedom. When we think of freedom, we usually imagine a life without a job and with the ability to go anywhere in the world and do anything we want. And to live freely like that, you have to have tons of money. But freedom can't be bought with money. Even if you have all the money in the world, if your mind is not free, you lose the real advantages of that wealth. Unless you are able to find freedom in the present moment, you will always come back to the same emotional states even after you win the lottery or get a huge inheritance. Money can buy things that will make you feel happy temporarily, but without true fulfillment that comes from within, true freedom will escape you. The truth is that many of us have more freedom and more options than we might even realize. If we get stuck, however, believing that our modest bank account means we have only modest freedom, we are bound to miss out on our true potential for happiness. Getting a high-paying job or a big contract or even winning the lottery is not a path to freedom. You probably don't need more money in the bank to free yourself. Reason number five, to gain love and attention. Money can attract love and attention, but relationships gained through money are fragile and superficial at best. When the money runs out, the love, respect, and friendship go with it. And even though money can attract love, it so often has the opposite effect. People are often repulsed by others who flaunt their money or expect special treatment because they are wealthy. And that is because money is not all that people require or want to live happily. We require the things that are found at a deeper level. When you try to gain love through your money, you base all your own worth on how much you have. And though it will impress some people, when it comes down to it, most people look for more in a friend or a lover than just wealth. So when your money fails to create deep and lasting relationships, your self-worth will suffer and all the money you've made won't be able to improve it. People in this situation tend to start feeling paranoid about the friends they do have. They think that people want them around only because they have money. But money is what these people use to get respect and friendship in the first place. Reason number six, to express love and appreciation. Money is just a neutral energy. 
It can be a weapon when used with resentment and anger, or it can nurture with love and care. Money is a vehicle for our emotions and attitudes. People want money so they can express the love and appreciation they feel in their lives. This is an ideal reason to accumulate money, but there's actually something we should be careful about here. Just because you don't have a lot of money, don't think you can't express love and gratitude for people. Big gifts are exciting, but we are really moved by the intention and feeling behind them. The amount of love given is not equal to the size or expense of a gift. We remember the emotional connections, our deep trust in people, the memories we have together. And the energy of a positive relationship turns ordinary money into happy money. So when you do have the chance to use money in an act of love, you can be sure that it is money well invested. Happy money compounds at a high rate of interest. The person you give it to uses it to generate more, and more eventually comes back to you. What matters is how the money inspires action. How happy are you with the money you currently have? Are you happy with your financial situation now? Do you feel blessed and energized about life when you think of money? Or do you feel frustrated when you think of money? Do you think the reason you chose in the previous section has anything to do with your current relationship or feeling toward money? I'm going to share a little something with you. It doesn't matter how much you have or make. It is your feelings about money that determine your wealth. If you don't have a healthy attitude and you feel negative about money, then no amount of money in the bank is going to change your relationship with money. What's in your wallet? If there is indeed happy money and unhappy money, what kind of money are you carrying around? Check your wallet, just as a mysterious wallet woman asked to do. Even though you can't see the smile of the money physically, you can pretty much guess if it is smiling or not. If you are happy with your work and life, your money is more than likely smiling in your wallet. If you hate your job and always complain about something in your life, your money is crying or angry in your wallet. We all want our money to smile. If it isn't, then you have to ask yourself, what is wrong with my life? You may not be satisfied with how much you make or how much you have, you may feel that your partner doesn't appreciate your hard work and complains too much about how little money you make. If money were a person, who would it be? If money were a person, there are several personas it could have. What would your money's personification be? Would that person be gentle and kind or mean and unfriendly? Remember, your experiences in the past. For some people, Money can be a cruel force that deprives them of many opportunities. Money may have given others all they ever needed and wanted. Perhaps money gave you a few surprises in the past too. Maybe it came through your grandparents, a few scholarships, some foundations, or a generous bonus at the end of a tough work quarter. If money has always been kind to you, you feel safe knowing it will always be there in the future. When people have had great experiences with money, as in, they could always count on it being there and trust that it will be there in the future, chances are they are having a great life. They may not be wealthy, but they seem to feel blessed. Things just work out for them. When they imagine the future, it is not difficult to see a bright one. For those who have not had good experiences with money, I am sorry that life's been unfair. I am sorry that things weren't easy in the past, but I can assure you that doesn't mean your future is fixed or that you can't turn your life around or change your feelings toward money. Money can be bad, but it can also be good. Very good. You may wonder why it is so different to different people. You may be wondering why some people have parents who help them pay for college and always seem to have their needs met, while others struggle to put food on the table. I believe money changes its character according to the places and whose hands it is in. So when you are fearful, you project fear onto money. Money is no friend to you. If you are happy, money is more likely a joyful force. It's always going to be there for you. If money has been tainted for generations with negative thoughts and beliefs, like those of scarcity, then you can be sure you'll never have enough money, unless, of course, 
You change the energy around the money you make, receive, and give away. Each of us is stuck in a unique money dilemma. I have friends from all walks of life. I have friends who live as far away from money as possible and are enjoying their life in a forest. They grow their own food and spend only $1,000 a year. They do virtually everything without money, using it only for medical supplies and miscellaneous items they can't grow or make themselves. I have other friends who are extremely affluent and think nothing of spending $1,000 on wine or a casual lunch. I have friends who are elite experts in their fields, doctors, lawyers, and successful business owners who have several public companies. And I have friends who own mom-and-pop drugstores and small shops, work in factories, drive trucks, or do physical labor. No matter whom I talk to from any walk of life, when I am interviewing them, Invariably, they start complaining about their life and ask me for advice. And without exception, both the rich and the poor have similar worries and concerns, and almost all always feel overwhelmed by money. But for different reasons. The super-rich don't worry so much about money at the moment, but they worry about their future. They admit they are afraid their success may not last forever. They have seen many people who have failed on their way to the top and who have either lost all that they earned or were in a bad situation. They worry about their kids and complain about how they are not handling money prudently. Even all the money in the world doesn't prevent people from worrying about money. Yet people with seemingly moderate amounts also have worries and complaints. People in the middle class tend to complain about money in a different way. Their biggest frustration is that the demand for their money and resources is often larger than their income. They feel stretched by the pressure of expenses. This is exacerbated if they have kids. They are in a constant battle with their children about allowances and how to spend money. On top of that, they have to save for their kids' education and worry that they won't have enough money of their own for a comfortable or happy retirement. On top of all this, they are pressed for time. They spend every waking moment either working for or worrying about money and how to balance it all. Those in the lower middle class often feel like they are being taken advantage of. Somebody is always trying to get something for nothing from them. They feel marginalized and undervalued in the working world. They don't think that the rich people who hire them realize the sacrifices they make to work hard for so little pay, while the rich enjoy the fruits of all their labor. And finally, the financially challenged or poor are just struggling to survive and can't even see past the need to get by. Money, never mind that having too much of it can cause other problems and worries, is a mystery to them. You often hear people say, I'd like to have those rich people problems. Yes, to a poor person who is hungry, the rich person's problems don't seem so terrible. Regardless of our situation and our financial status in life, we all are affected by money one way or another. And how we react to our situation can make us happy or unhappy. So, can money buy happiness? People often hear the common expression, money can't buy happiness. If this is true, then why are so many people clamoring to make more money? Do they want to be unhappy? Why do so many people want money desperately? Why do some even go as far as to commit crimes in order to get more? Needless to say, there are some great benefits to having money. When you ask five-year-old kids what they want, they usually answer something tangible, like candies or toys. But if you ask 10-year-old kids, they say, Money! I will decide what I want to buy with it later. So even young kids seem to figure out early that money is like some form of a magic wand that can create miracles. It will turn into whatever you want it to be. At the same time, we know money cannot buy happiness. Maybe we want to believe this to comfort ourselves when we don't have money. Yet, when we hear that some friends won money in the lottery or inherited money from distant relatives, we feel a pang of jealousy. We were fine moments before we heard the news, but as soon as we find out someone got something and we didn't, it suddenly doesn't feel so okay anymore. So we say, money can't buy happiness and we feel a little better about our plight without the Mega Millions jackpot payout. 
Taking a Zen Approach to Happiness and Money The Zen approach to happiness invites us to think about ourselves not in terms of what we do or what we are worth or what we have, but in terms of who we are. And what are we? Human beings. Our purpose as humans is to be. What does that mean? It means being present in the moment. It means being fully grateful and in alignment with where our bodies and minds are at one time. If you're present in the moment, you aren't thinking about the past, your mistakes, your issues, the harm done to you and getting angry about it. And if you're present, you're not thinking about the future, its unexpected outcomes, its potential for disasters. If you're not thinking about the future, you're not anxious, you're not fearful, and you're not stressed. So much of our stress, anxiety, and unhappiness about money comes from thinking about our past mistakes or harm done to us and needlessly worrying about all the uncertainty of the future. Our past and future selves rob our present selves of happiness when we allow ourselves to get derailed by these negative thoughts. Happiness, then, truly comes from within. So we can agree that money cannot buy happiness. Nothing can. However, I will contend that it is a lot easier to be present and free from anger about the past and worry about the future if money isn't such an overwhelming force in one's life. I have interviewed so many people for my books, and not all of them are necessarily financially well off. Yet after interviewing them all, I did come to this conclusion. Money cannot buy happiness, but money certainly eases some of the discomfort in life. In other words, the less worry and stress you have, the more time you have to be. If you have money, you don't have to worry all the time about whether you can pay the bills at the end of every month. You can treat your friends to something if you want. You can give a gift to your potential partner. Though money certainly helps, it is not essential to happiness. There are several studies about how much one earns and its relationship to happiness and they always show that people's happiness level goes up as their income goes up, but only up to about $75,000. Beyond this threshold, one's level of happiness doesn't go higher with any more income, because there will be more money-related stress compared to the joy that more money brings into one's life. When I talk about this in New York and Tokyo, I get the same response. Everyone says, there is no way you can make a happy living with that little money. And this can be true. The cost of living varies depending on where you live. But the important thing you should know is that making more money doesn't guarantee happiness. This may make you wonder about people who make less than $75,000 in a year. The truth is, I've met people who are happy even though they can barely make ends meet. How do they do it? It's because they have a good relationship with money. It doesn't define who they are. They don't need it to keep up with the Joneses. And they don't stress out about the future or things they can't control. They don't believe in the myth of scarcity. They know they'll always have enough of what they need when they need it. They are okay with where they are and who they are. They aren't hypnotized into thinking that having a bigger house or a flashier car is going to somehow magically transform their life and take away all their problems. They know they have something to say about their own happiness. Money doesn't control or have power over them. They have power over it. Most important, they aren't afraid of money. Afraid of money? Who's afraid of money? More people than you realize. Love or fear, your relationship with money. Some time ago, I translated Dr. Gerald Jampolsky's best-selling book, Love is Letting Go of Fear in which he contends that there are two kinds of communication, love and fear. And I contend that when it comes to money, there are two approaches to it, love and fear. When you earn and spend money, you do it with either love or fear. For example, we are afraid of money all the time. We are afraid that what we have may not be enough for a rainy day. We are afraid we may lose it. We are afraid others have more of it than we do, or that if others earn more or get more, there will be less for us. We are afraid we might lose our jobs. If we did, how would we pay all the bills? 
Even when we spend money, we do so out of fear. If I am not spending my money in a deliberate or smart way, I will lose money. Sometimes we feel pressure when we spend money. We are afraid we're being taken advantage of, scammed, that we're spending too much, or what if we get the wrong thing and don't like it in a few months? We worry that if we buy one thing, we won't have enough for something else later. Many of us let fear creep into our decisions without even realizing it. Granted, some of these fears are rational and therefore a reason. The fears are tied to survival. If we mess up with money, we won't have a place to live, food to eat, or clothes to wear. Some people are born with a stronger sense of fear, or it is cultivated in their homes by their parents and relatives who have negative or fear-based relationships with money, while others don't have any fear at all. It doesn't seem to cross their minds that money will ever run out. Since we were very small, we have been told to do the right thing with our money. Our parents didn't even know what that meant, but it didn't stop them from saying it. We were scolded about money, about what we spent it on, how we lost it, and how careless we were with it. We carry those fears with us into adulthood without even realizing it or recognizing how much fear is attached to our actions with money. Unfortunately, our current financial system is based on fear. Our society is based on fear. Our education system, our workplaces, and possibly our home lives too. We fear doing the wrong thing and being punished. We fear that others have what we don't have, so we become greedy. We fear resources are limited or scarce, so we take more than we should and waste more than we should. We fear that other children will get ahead of ours and have more advantages, so we send our kids to expensive schools and then complain about paying taxes for public schools. We are fearful enough that our kids will misbehave or embarrass us, that we scold them and control them. Needless to say, using fear is not an effective way to get what you want. It is often destructive and causes lasting harm. In a sense, it is no surprise that so many of us are fearful around money. It is an automatic response. If you don't pay much attention to your mind, you will hardly be aware that fear is what motivates your actions, whether at home, at work, in your community, or in the way you behave with money. What it means to have a loving, abundant relationship with money. The opposite of fear is love. To love is to have no fear that something will harm or leave you. It requires your trust and belief that whoever is the object of your love will always be there. Most of us are told that our parents love us, but their methods of love might have been expressed more like fear. Their anxiety and worry held us back from trying new things. Their worry about money prevented them from letting us take chances in our careers or relationships. Fear looks, sounds, and feels like control. Love, on the other hand, feels like the opposite. It is unconditional acceptance. It's a willingness to trust that things will work out. It feels like letting go. Love feels a lot like just being in the moment. No anger about the past. No worries about the future. You're happy to be here now. You are grateful, intensely grateful, for all you have. And where there is gratitude, there is joy and enthusiasm. And joy and enthusiasm makes you happy. What it's like to live with a loving relationship to money. It's hard for a lot of us to imagine what it looks like to have a worry-free, stress-free relationship with money. But let's imagine it for a second. I want you to imagine that it is possible to live peacefully with money. People who live in love with money are doing what they love and make enough money. In fact, they often say, I have enough, or I have all that I need. They may not be rich, but they truly have everything they need. They put what they love in the center of their life. They are financially comfortable, so they don't feel stress around money in everyday life. When they go to a restaurant or shop, they choose not by the price, but by their preference. That doesn't mean they always buy expensive stuff. They are just choosy. They know what they want, so they don't need to buy many things. Nor do they need to buy expensive or brand name things, because they're not looking to others for external validation. They are already happy with themselves, who they are, and what they want to be. 
Their relationships, then, are authentic. They hang around with people they like, not people they are trying to impress or who are trying to impress them. They have a good relationship with their family and can spend quality time with them because they're not working so hard to make a few extra dollars. And though sometimes they feel money stress, they tell themselves, this happens sometimes, and I'm always able to get through it. It will all work out. They know how to let go of stress and not control things out of fear of what could go wrong. They can separate what is real and what is not in regard to their fears when it comes to money. Ultimately, these people choose how to approach money. They are deliberate in the response and reaction to it. They are Zen. And we can all choose our approach to money, to our life. How? I believe it begins with gratitude. Instead of believing there is never enough, you begin thinking, I have all that I need, and I am so grateful for it all. I am grateful for the work I do, the food I eat, the car I drive, and all the money I make. When money comes in, you say, thank you. Or as we say in Japan, arigato. Even when money leaves you, you can say it again. Grateful for how the money served you or what it is bringing to you now. Whatever happens, you can say thank you. Thank you is a powerful phrase that will help you start to transform your relationship with money. The more you do this, the less stress you'll have and the more happiness will flow through you and your money. And you'll begin to see without much effort how quickly the unhappy money in your wallet starts to grow and smile and turn into happy money. Chapter 2 Money IQ and Money EQ in my early 20s, before I had the good fortune of learning from my mentor, Wahe, I started studying the concept of money intensively, reading any book that had money or investment in the title. I attended seminars and lectures of well-known business people. In order to impress the speakers, I made an effort to pose interesting questions after the lecture and then follow up with a complimentary letter in which I asked them to take me on as a disciple or assistant. Most of the time, these methods of flattery didn't work, but some of the recipients liked my passion and took me out for lunch and shared their knowledge and experiences with me. And it was from these encounters that I discovered that not all wealthy and seemingly successful individuals are the same, and that even though they look like they have it all from the outside, their real lives are quite different from the way they present them. Once while waiting for a new mentor of mine to show up for a scheduled meeting, I casually asked his secretary about him. She looked somewhat puzzled and said, I just started working here so I don't know him well. Not long after that, I learned that not many people stuck around long enough to get to know him. Because of his harsh and demanding attitude, people left his office only months after they started working for him. By the time I realized this, I was rushing to the door myself. However. Other millionaires I met were warm, friendly, well-respected, and loved by the people who worked for them, who had nothing but good things to say about their employers. These leaders are what we call the real deal. A general rule I go by is that when the staff speaks ill of a leader behind his or her back, chances are he or she is not that decent of a person. You can get away with appearing wonderful to the masses for a little while, but the people you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis will always know who is the real deal and who is not. Having money and the trappings of success doesn't always equate to being a person who has something positive to offer the world. There's more to it. But this brings up an interesting conundrum. Why are people who are phony, cunning, or shrewd seemingly so successful and wealthy? It doesn't add up. I wanted to get to the bottom of this. When I first started my investigation, I thought there was a clear path to becoming successful, a definite order to the steps you could follow. Simply put, the popular notion presented in a lot of financial books is this. You work hard and make money, save it, and invest it, and then someday, you will be rich. I naively thought that would be the way I would do it too. But is it that simple? As you may already know, in reality, people who work hard and make a lot of money don't necessarily succeed in the traditional sense. Then there are those who are quite shrewd and cunning with money. 
The thing I realized about this second type of person is that their reputation eventually catches up with them. Trust me, word always gets around. And in the long run, being a con artist or even just a disingenuous business person doesn't pay. Sure, someone might succeed once or twice, but keeping up appearances simply isn't sustainable. And people in this category tend to be greedy. They want all the fame and attention and money for themselves. So they cut corners, pinch pennies, and withhold money from people who are deserving of it. In contrast, I found that people with warm hearts and a sincere interest in benefiting others often succeeded in the long run. Generosity seemed to be their hallmark. In addition, they had a more relaxed attitude toward their money. One of my mentors said, The key to success is always lose just a bit every time you make a deal. What he meant was that everyone walks away feeling good and that the other party feels like he or she won. As a result of this practice, he got a great reputation for being honest and sincere, always putting his business partners and clients first. No one ever felt like they were getting taken advantage of by him. Once he established this reputation, he never ran out of clients or business because everybody wanted to work with him. But was his story an aberration? I wondered. I had observed many cunning people, kind people, and everyone in between. Great businessmen who never seemed to catch a break. Successful business owners who seemed to make obscene amounts of money but lost it all. And successful people who didn't seem to have a clue as to what they were doing. I also witnessed people who never went to college and never even received basic knowledge on investing but found amazing success because they were great at what they did and clients liked them. Confused, I asked my mentor, Wahe, about my observations. He told me that financial wisdom consists of two parts, money IQ and money EQ. Money IQ, intelligence quotient, is focused on financial intelligence, which you obtain when learning about investing, tax law, and general monetary knowledge. Money EQ, emotion quotient, is the emotional intelligence required to deal with your reactions toward money. Even though you may have an MBA education, if your money EQ is low, you could very well end up losing money. That is why there is a long list of extremely intelligent individuals in this world with lots of letters after their names who have made bad choices and gone bankrupt. In order to achieve a happy money life, you need to have both a healthy money IQ and a healthy money EQ. Once you know about the intelligent and emotional aspects of making money, you will have a great relationship with it. Wow, I finally got it. I felt the mystery of why some people have money and some people lose it was solved. But knowing this information and being able to do something about it are two different things. Since first learning this lesson from my own mentor, I've seen a thing or two in my day and even experienced times when I made and lost money, and I can finally say, I've arrived at a place where I have happy money and live comfortably. Some call me a happy little millionaire. So how do you get your money IQ and EQ up high enough so that you can live the life of a happy little millionaire like me? I think the first thing you need to do is understand the basics of money IQ and EQ. Money IQ from the perspective of a happy little millionaire. Money IQ tends to be misunderstood as money management, but that is not its key function. Sure, it's necessary to understand the deeper meaning behind the intellectual aspects of money. That means looking at how you make, spend, protect, and increase it. Making money. Making money the way a happy little millionaire would means doing the things you love to do and sharing that gift or talent with others. When you put the most importance on being your sincere true self and share your joy with those around you, you'll inevitably succeed. In order to make money, many people believe they need to betray their own values or control others. Making money is not about finding ways to defeat the competition or more easily and effectively turn a profit. Making money means being true to yourself and then being able to share your abilities with the world. As a result, you spread joy everywhere you go, and the money you receive is simply an expression of your clients' or patrons' gratitude. Spending money when you spend money like a happy little millionaire with a high money IQ, you don't do it with an eye to being thrifty. Instead, your spending is always conscious. 
You're mindful of your true self and what makes you happy, and therefore you're able to put your money toward things that best express your desires. You don't want to waste your money on things that don't benefit your well-being. And because you've made these conscious choices, the result is that you never feel like your money is wasted. One of the best books that details and analyzes how people spend money that results in the highest level of satisfaction is Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. They look at all the ways in which people spend their money, and those who spend on experiences that align with their values seem to be the happiest overall. They pored over studies and observed human behavior and found that those who are focused not on accumulating things but rather on experiencing things and being fully alive in the present moment, Zen, felt the best about how they spent their money. If spending money well means being thrifty or saving, then life can become a bit agonizing. In fact, life becomes a game of putting one's wants further and further away. You may want to investigate your instincts to be careful and thrifty. Why are you afraid to spend? Which of your fears are associated with spending? What price are you willing to pay for things that make you happy? When you assess your priorities and are mindful of activities that truly bring you joy, you can spend more confidently and know that the money you do spend is being used intelligently. Protecting Money Protecting money is less about hoarding it and keeping it away from others and more about creating meaningful relationships around money and others and keeping the boundaries between them clear. If you've ever felt that there are people in your life who have designs on your money, such as family, friends, employees, and clients, then the problem isn't with the money, it's with your relationships. If any of these people would plot to take money from you, there is a problem. For example, one of the most common and costly causes of divorce is money issues. Either the husband or the wife tends to spend more than the other would like or can afford. Usually, one party keeps important financial information from the other in order to protect themselves or their money. The result? A fractured relationship which inevitably leads to divorce. And in the attempt to protect their money, they end up losing more to begin with. Anyone who has ever been through a divorce knows just how costly it can be. So the best way to protect one's money is to protect one's relationship with people. This obviously includes being clear and forthright on the terms of promises and always obeying the law. But the most important thing you can do is foster relationships in which you can communicate openly and honestly. If the relationships with the people around you are honest and clear, there is little need to protect your money far beyond that. Increasing money. When we talk about increasing money, most people automatically imagine investments and other techniques. However, for a happy little millionaire, increasing money is more than just surface level knowledge of the economy. Rather, it means finding a purpose that you believe in from the heart and then aiding that purpose with money. With a mind on the long term, you support your purpose in every way to make it successful. The important deciding factor in becoming a happy little millionaire is to align your money with your values and convictions. Your investment practices should include your own activities and businesses, and the fruits of your labors, the profits, are yours to keep and enjoy. When you do this, you realize that markets will fluctuate, so you don't worry about investing during downturns or crises. You don't even consider whether or not you will profit, because your priority is to support people who share your values and vision. The long-term gain is always the same. You become successful because you're steadily investing, and eventually markets turn around. In the meantime, all the good, happy money you invested and the causes and purposes you care so deeply about have flourished. Money EQ from the perspective of a happy little millionaire. Money EQ is all about how we react to money emotionally. So it's necessary to understand the deeper meaning behind the emotional aspects of money. That means looking at how you receive, enjoy, feel confident about, and share your money. Receiving money. The act of receiving is the most important thing when it comes to enriching your life. If you aren't willing to receive happiness and abundance, then no matter how much money you have and no matter what high status you attain, you will never feel happy and abundant. 
Receiving means allowing yourself the freedom to receive and knowing that you have inherent value that is worthy of receiving good things. I can't express how important it is to be willing to receive gifts, opportunities, and chances given to you. Oftentimes people fail to see the good things right in front of them instead of receiving them joyfully. They are so focused on a set outcome of their own negative beliefs, they miss amazing opportunities right under their noses and set themselves up for failure by chasing things that aren't meant for them. Have you ever been so preoccupied with working hard to earn the thing that you think you need that you missed out on something directly in front of you? If you shift your attention to the things that you can receive, you can begin to realize just how much you are given. When you open yourself up to receiving, that is the beginning of realizing true abundance. Enjoying Money When you appreciate something that you are enjoying, you become truly connected to the present moment. You are in a Zen moment. To be fully present and engaged is the definition of happiness. There is no past, no future, only the present, which is a gift. And when you are enjoying this gift, this present, you are experiencing this thing I have been referring to as abundance. However, most people do not feel this way. For most, life is a competition. Even when they earn something, there isn't time to waste just enjoying it. They have to prepare for the next race. If they don't, they believe that maybe next time they will lose to someone else. People in this competitive scarcity mindset are disconnected from the present moment. They regret their past failures or worry endlessly and needlessly about the failures to come. The result is that they never get to appreciate and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Isn't that the same as having no fruits at all? To experience abundance, you are required to be 100% in the present moment. In order to enjoy life and wealth, stop and smell the proverbial roses. If you're always rushing through each moment simply to get to the next, you're missing out on all the abundance that is available to you now. Trusting the money flow. We worry about money because we are afraid and can't trust the money will always come in. To fully realize that potential of your life, it isn't just money and abundance that is important. Confidence in your own abilities matters as well. Even when your supply of money is low, confidence and self-esteem lead to the heart of abundance. Yet it wouldn't be a stretch to say that many people are overpowered by doubt. And the road of self-doubt leads to only one place, fear. Fear of trying new things. Fear of doing anything. Fear of sharing your skills and talents. Fear of ridicule. If you want to become a happy little millionaire, you have to muster confidence in yourself and your abilities. People who are confident aren't that way because they're rich. They are rich because they are confident. And when we are able to trust the flow of money both in and out of our lives, being confident comes naturally. A big cause of money stress is that people don't trust the flow of money. They are worried that the money they make will not be enough to support their future. They worry that their ideas and projects won't be worth all the time and energy spent. But if we are going to be decisive and act with confidence, we have to accept that money is a fluctuating thing. Sharing When you are living like a happy little millionaire, you know that life is something to be shared. Sharing your joy with people and offering your skills to them requires no hesitation. You know that sharing joy with people increases your own personal joy exponentially. Once happiness is experienced as something you do with others, you realize that there really is no other way to do it. Doing something solely for yourself is no longer interesting. Sharing should be part of every aspect of your life. Whether you're sharing joy, money, services, or your gifts or talents matters little. It just matters that you do it, that you share. And that means sharing with everyone you meet with your family, your friends, your coworkers, your clients, your customers, and society. The more you share and the more generous you are with your time, talents, and gifts, the more abundance will flow to you. Why? The principle of sharing is connected to natural law. The natural world is one of sharing. Everything is tied together mutually, and when one part suffers, 
the whole is thrown off balance. If many people were to become more open to sharing and partaking in the joy of life together, many of the world's problems would soon disappear. As Lynn Twist puts it so eloquently, in The Soul of Money, Transforming Your Relationship with Money and Life, Money is like water. It can be a conduit for commitment, a currency of love. Money moving in the direction of our highest commitments nourishes our world and ourselves. What you appreciate, appreciates. When you make a difference with what you have, it expands. Collaboration creates prosperity. True abundance flows from enough, never from more. Money carries our intention. If we use it with integrity, then it carries integrity forward. Know the flow. Take responsibility for the way your money moves in the world. Let your soul inform your money and your money express your soul. Access your assets, not only money, but also your own character and capabilities, your relationships, and other non-money resources. Money EQ Types Your relationship with money expresses itself in a pattern to a certain extent. If you've never been taught about money, you will likely fall into one of a few common personality types. Knowing your own pattern is a means by which to understand the motivation behind the actions you take. The first step to creating a healthier relationship with money is to take an honest look at the map and acknowledge where you are standing right now. When you understand the situation you are presently in, the next step is to turn around and research how you got there and where you came from. You may realize quite a lot about yourself in the process. Explore family secrets, stories from your mother's and father's youths, or even surprising facts about your grandparents when they were growing up. Researching your roots in this way allows you to understand yourself more deeply. Once you have identified your roots, you can reprogram yourself with new values that reflect who you truly are and who you would like to be. From a money EQ perspective, People who engage with money can be broadly separated into three types. The type who actively engages with money and tries to control it. The type who tries to have nothing to do with money. And the type who actively tries to stay as far away from money as possible. I call the type who tries to have nothing to do with money the indifferent type. And the type who actively tries to stay as far away as possible the monk type. There are also three variations of the type who actively engages with money depending on how they try to control it. The hoarder, the spender, and the money-making addict. These three subtypes, in addition to the first two types I named in the paragraph above, make up the five most basic money personalities. Among the three personality types who actively engage with money, there are a few more common ones that show up as a combination of two or more of the basic types. For example, hoarder plus spender equals the repressed spender type. This is usually someone who saves up a certain amount and then spends, blows, it all at once. Spender plus money-making addict equals the gambler type. Someone with this personality type earns a lot and doesn't hesitate to spend a lot. Hoarder plus spender plus money-making addict equals the worrier type. Someone who is a combination of all three active money types is most likely to spend every waking hour of their day worrying. When it comes down to it, though, there are several distinct money personality types that are the result of varying combinations of all of the above. Let's find out which personality sounds vaguely familiar to you. The Compulsive Saver, Stockpiler This money EQ personality type absolutely loves saving money. Their favorite hobby is saving money. Their special talent also happens to be, surprise, surprise, saving money. If they saw a quarter on the street, they would pick it up and put it directly into their piggy bank at home. They believe saving money is the best way to guarantee a sense of security in life. It is so central to their way of life that their actual lifestyle is often quite frugal. They're usually experts on bargain shopping. They would be able to give you excellent advice on which phone company is the cheapest which point cards are worth it, and when to buy plane tickets at the lowest possible price. 
This type of person feels most alive when they check their savings account and see that it is going up at a steady rate. The compulsive saver type views enjoying the luxuries of life as a mortal enemy. In fact, it's usually a general rule that none of their hobbies or routine activities cost much money, if any at all. They have often forgotten the dreams of their childhood about how they wanted their life to turn out someday, no longer concerned with what inspired them to start saving in the first place. The backstory to most compulsive savers comes from bad memories and fears about money from their childhood. They often grew up in a house without much money, suffering many painful or lonely experiences as a result. The family business may have gone bankrupt, or their parents could have been unable to earn enough money. It's very common for the effects of a bankruptcy in the grandparents' generation to carry down all the way to the current generation, passing along a fear that money will run out. If this personality type suffered due to their parents' poor relationship with money, they will often carry a strong determination not to turn out the same way. However, they are often unaware of or unable to recognize at what point fears about money took over and began controlling their lives. Compulsive savers are convinced that their reasoning is sound and they are doing everything in just the right way. If you think you might be a compulsive saver, it might be a good opportunity to finally confront your anxieties or fears about money and look deeper into when you developed them in the first place. No matter how much you save, it will never erase the unease you feel about money that motivates you to tightly hold on to it as much as possible in the first place. Many compulsive savers are so afraid of running out of money that they will go their entire lives without spending any of the money they saved up for so long. The Compulsive Spender Spendthrift The compulsive spender type simply loves spending money. If this money EQ personality type saw money on the sidewalk, Depositing it into a piggy bank like a compulsive saver would never occur to them as an option. Compulsive spenders would take it straight to the nearest vending machine and enjoy a free drink. They would also never understand compulsive savers' guilt over spending money on something, instead feeling uncomfortable setting money aside. As friends, 